We're in Galatians today. So Senny uh, introduced us to Galatians last week, as you remember, and um, it was uh, it was very good. He did a very good job. And so um, we're going to continue on in Galatians. And so we're up to uh, chapter one, verses 11 to 24. So if you have your Bible with you, could you please uh, turn there? And um, that's where we're going to uh, to read right now in uh, in Galatians chapter one, eleven to twenty four. And this is what it says: I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man nor was I taught it, rather I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. Almost a little bit like what we've just seen on TV, <laughs> on the screen here. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. My immediate response was not to consult any human being, I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia and later I returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas, that's Peter, and stayed with him for 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I'm writing to you is no lie. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praise God because of me. What an amazing testimony. Heavenly Father, bless your word to us today, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Doesn't seem to be moving, guys. There we go. So I just wanted to uh, comment briefly before I got too far into this that um, that uh, Paul and Saul are the same guys, okay? And so I just wanted to mention, too, that um, Saul didn't have his name changed on the Damascus Road uh, or anything like that. So Saul, of course, he was a... Um, uh, a Benjaminite and probably got his name from King Saul, who was also a Benjaminite way back in the in the day, and um, possibly named after him. But um, Saul is the Hebrew name, and Paul is the Greek name. And of course, in Luke, uh, Luke, it was the first bloke to um, to kind of write that in Acts thirteen nine, where he talks about Saul, and in the same sentence also named Paul. So just wanted to mention that uh, first up before we got into it, because I'll be kind of referring to Saul and Paul and yeah, they're the same bloke, no difference. And um, it, he wasn't kind of had his name changed because he had a massive conversion. The Lord didn't change his name. It was just that it was um, uh, the Hebrew and the Greek names. So the gospel of Jesus. Here we go. That's, that's working. The gospel of Jesus. Paul is saying the gospel, the good news, the, the story about Jesus Christ is not a story made up by men or made up by me. I didn't make it up. God gave it to me. I received this gospel message directly from Jesus Christ. I didn't receive it from any man. 
And he goes at great lengths to tell us that he didn't go and talk to the apostles and kind of, you know, collaborate his story or anything like that. He says, I didn't receive it from any man. I received it directly from the Lord Jesus. He received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ, it says. And of course, some people were trying to, as we heard last week, trying to pervert the gospel message from faith in God to faith and works, i.e. doing something to gain favor with both God and man. And so keeping the law of the Old Testament and adding to it faith in Jesus Christ. And um, Paul is refuting that. And if you're a believer here today, you have heard the gospel message, and that's why you know the Lord. And of course, the gospel message is clearly explained to us through the, the, uh, the writings of Paul. And in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, for it is by grace you have been saved. Through faith, this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So the gospel of Jesus is the good news that Christ died for my sin, and he died for your sin, and he died for the sins of the world. And... Uh, John 3, 16 reminds us of that. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Do you believe that? Have you trusted him? Accepted him? In uh, Romans 3, again, Paul writing, in uh, Romans 3, 22 to 26, and I'm reading from the Living Translation. And this is what it says. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law. As was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. Verse 22, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Jesus Christ when he freed us from the penalty for our sin. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in, in, in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just. And he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. And what a wonderful thing that is. He makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. And may that bring joy to your heart today. If you have believed in Jesus. If you believe that. There's the next step. If you believe that. There's the next step. Romans 10, 9 says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you'll believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Have you professed your faith? Have you told your neighbor about your faith? Oh, no, that's too hard. Well, I couldn't do that. Well, you need maybe to review your belief in Jesus. I don't think Paul ever thought that he would find himself telling others that Jesus was the Messiah. 
and that they should make the decision to follow him. Prior to this, of course, Paul was a, a Jewish Pharisee, and he was passionate and radically orthodox when it came to practicing Judaism. And in verse 14, it says, he was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the tradition of my fathers. And in Acts chapter 8 and, and chapter 9, Paul is like a Jewish bounty hunter. And he's looking to arrest and punish other Jews who dared to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And his reputation among the Jewish community was such that it, it struck fear in their hearts. They were afraid. They were afraid of Saul. But one day, all that changed. He's on his way to bust the Christians in Damascus. You'll recall the story. And he walked into a roadside setup. He got stitched up by Jesus. And what a wonderful thing that was. The Lord Jesus transformed his life forever. And the Bible says, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground, heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul said, who are you, Lord? And the answer came, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And Paul put his faith and trust in the Lord. And that was the, the moment when Saul's life did a complete 180 degree turn. And what a wonderful thing that is. As we read the Bible, we see God calling people to service for him. Way back in the Old Testament, God called Abraham. He called Isaac. He called Jacob. He called Joseph, Moses, Joshua. Not in any significant order, but these are just some of the people that God called into service for him. And then there was the judges, Deborah, Gideon, Samson. And you remember how young Samuel got called. There's a wee boy, a little boy, on his bed at night. God called him. Here I am, he said. Your servant is listening. And then there was the prophets, Elijah and Elisha. Jesus called the disciples. And he called Saul. He called Saul, whose name changed to Paul. And so the Lord Jesus wanted Paul. He wanted to use that same zeal, that enthusiasm, and the skills he had used in persecuting Christians or followers of the way, the Bible says, to proclaim and publicize that Jesus is the Messiah. And this is the call that Paul alluded to when he says in the passage, set apart and called me by his grace. Being called is a word or phrase that, that God uses uh, in the act of tapping someone on the shoulder and saying, if we were in Australia, we would say, g'day, mate, I've something I want you to do. Of something I want you to give your life to. There's this need, and I want you to be part of the solution. Paul was called by God. He was tapped on the shoulder in a really significant way. I want to use your work life to be my man, to be my woman. Our work being God's call upon every believer to help connect people with Jesus. Your work is God's call. You go to work so that you can connect people with Jesus. If you're a believer here today, you're called by God. God called you. He's enabled you to put your, his, your faith and trust in him. 
Somewhere in your life, God tapped you on the shoulder. He said, Alan, I want you to trust me. And I was convicted of my sin and of my need of him. And I put my faith in him. I trusted him. I love hearing testimonies when people came to know the Lord. And the result of that. And so God has called you to connect people with Jesus. And here at Caribbee, we run Sunday school. Why? To connect people with Jesus. We run hands and feet. Why? To connect people with Jesus. There's youth groups, there's buddies, there's Bible studies and home groups and play groups and all these things to connect people with Jesus. And God has called you and put his hand on you and enabled you to trust and follow him so that you can connect people with Jesus. And in Jeremiah 1, 5, it says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah was called by God. Are you thinking you're called by God? Are you thinking God has something for me to do, someone for me to talk to? He has. And you are called by God. And you do have people to talk to. Psalm 139 says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of, sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I am awake, I am still with you. God thinks about you. God knows you. God has you engraved in, on his hand as we were talking last week. God has called you. Writing to the Christians, Paul again in, in 1 Corinthians 7, 17, he wrote, Nevertheless, each one should retain the place in life that the Lord assigned to him and to which God has called him. Looking for confirmation from God about his calling, Gideon put a fleece out, you'll remember. He put a fleece out at night asking God that if he was hearing him correctly, that in the morning when he woke up, that the ground would be wet from the dew, but the fleece would be dry. And when that happened, he asked for confirmation again by asking God to make the fleece wet and the ground dry the next morning. God did so. And Paul is addressing here the Galatian believers, and he's encouraged them to live out the call that God has on their life. And that's what Paul did. God called him. He lived, he lived that out. Sometimes we tend to think that Paul made his living as a full-time minister or pastor of the gospel or preacher. But the truth of the matter is that Paul, he was a tent maker. <clears throat> and uh, if we refer to somebody as a tent maker missionary, it basically means that they're providing for their own needs, but they're in a location where they're working and preaching at the same time. And lots of people work in this way in countries where it's forbidden to preach the gospel. A lot of people in certain countries go there as uh, to serve the Lord, but they're going there in a um, in a working environment and they're providing for their own needs, but at the same time involved in mission work. And um, that was the role that I played when I was in Dumaji. I was working, but involved in the local uh, community, telling people about the Lord and involved in the local church. 
And so Paul made Jesus known, but he never abandoned his trade to do so. Paul was a leather worker. He made tents, and that's how he supported himself. He used his work life to support his life's work, his call of sharing the gospel of Jesus. All of us as believers in our churches are called by Jesus to do God's work wherever we are. And I think sometimes too many of us has developed the concept that God only calls perhaps the Billy Grahams or the Charles Stanleys uh, to preach. And he doesn't tap the shoulders of ordinary people to do special tasks for him. But he does. Each one of us is assigned to fulfill Christian mission, connecting people to Jesus. As definitely as any person in full-time ministry. And as Christians, as believers, we are to live listening to the Holy Spirit, giving directions in your, in your business, in your community, in your home, in your personal witness and life. Writing to the uh, Christians in Ephesus, Paul wrote, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. I wonder how you're going when it comes to living out this calling. Are you perhaps uncertain about what the call is? You need some clarification, uh, clarification and confirmation. Well, you could always put out a fleece. Be careful. The Lord might answer. But the, f the first thing we need to do is to be sharing our faith telling others about the Lord, encouraging them to follow him. In verse 16, Paul says, after he received his call, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I didn't talk to anybody. I didn't go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me and, um, you know, make sure I got my message straight. Instead, he says, I went to Arabia. And um, I've got a little map here somewhere. Right, so Arabia down in the Nabataean kingdom. According to my research, that is the Arabia that Paul went into down um, south there of Damascus. So he was up near Damascus, right up the top when... He had his experience on the road, and then he came right down to Arabia. And then later on, it says in verse 21, after he came back to Jerusalem and had a chat to Peter, and he also saw James, the Lord's brother. And then he says, I went to Syria and Cilicia. Okay, and that you can see that on the far map there up the top. Cilicia and Syria and um, one of the things that um, I was reminded of as I looked at those maps we often refer, refer to um, to Paul as Saul of Tarsus okay and you'll see Tarsus there in the um, in the right hand map there and that's where Paul was he was up there in Tarsus and what was he doing he was preaching to the Gentiles Paul was called to preach the word to the Gentiles, to preach the gospel. And so Arabia referred to the Nabataean kingdom, and it's centered in modern-day Jordan, extending right up to Damascus in the north and the western tip of what we now call Saudi Arabia. And after three years, he visited Peter in Jerusalem, met James while he was there, then he went to Syria and Cilicia up north. And then in verses 13 and 14 and 23 and 24, I want to talk about the power of the gospel. And of course, the testimony was of Paul or Saul at that time. He who once persecuted us is now preaching. And so this is the truth. The power of the gospel can change lives. And here's the thing. 
There are a lot of people who get caught up in the experience of Christianity. Perhaps come to church on Sunday, enjoy the show where the music is pumping and the people smile and the preacher delivers a message that is ch challenging enough to make them feel convicted, but which perhaps they will leave without any real determination to, to do anything about it. Oh, well, you know, you know, people and I know people that have some sort of salvation insurance and, um, because they had an experience somewhere in their life. Paul, he had an experience. He struck blind by a bright light. He hears a voice from heaven called in his name. And I doubt many of us can measure up in the sense of being able to say we have had an experience quite as dramatic as that. Maybe you have. But you know what's interesting? Paul's emphasis here is not on the experience, but on the change in his life. You see, the reality of our Christian experience is to be seen far more in the change than in the experience. And, and you know, we can take it a step further and say, if there's no change, then there is real reason to doubt whether the experience is credible or valid. Paul, by his own admission, was one who was leading the charge for Judaism and against this new sect led by Jesus, whom he considered an imposter. He was attentive to all of the Jewish regulations that he could be. And the word devout probably doesn't even begin to describe what Saul was like. The Bible says he was at the head of his class, outdistancing his contemporaries in the area of works of righteousness. He was probably a young fella and he was in doing university subjects when any, he was in grade 10, you know. So he was way above, the Bible says, above his contemporaries, his classmates, those that he was with. He outdistanced them. He was head of his class. His, um, he just left his contemporaries behind in the area of works and righteousness. His religion was not a hobby. It wasn't a secondary thing to him. It was his reason for living. And his purpose, he was so thoroughly devoted to the cause that he went around, as you're aware, trying to destroy Christianity with as much destructive power that he could muster. And he had authority to do so. He had the authority to do so. But over in Philippians 3, I'd like you to turn to this passage, please, just a couple of pages over. In um, Philippians chapter 3, this is, this is Paul. And again, you know, we're reminding ourselves that Paul is speaking to the Galatians who are kind of thinking that we need to do something extra to make sure that our our um, salvation is complete. We need to do some, you know, some good works and works and, and faith as well. And in, in verse number four, it says, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless, here we go. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ just to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Well, I think there was a change. I think there was a change in his life. I think it's fair to say that 
had God not radically intervened in Paul's life, there was no way this man would have come to Christ. And you know, that is true of you and I as well. The Bible says there is no one who does good. Romans tells us there's no one who seeks after God. God radically intervened in your life and my life to draw him to himself. Do you think about that? God intervened in your family. God brought someone across your path to to explain the gospel to you and by god's grace you have been able to accept that you and i have been brought to jesus so that we can connect other people to jesus connect your neighbor to jesus connect your family to jesus share the gospel Talk about the Lord. In Paul's life, the change is radical. He goes from persecutor to preacher. It not only gave credibility to his sermons, but was more powerful than all of them put together. And Paul uses this to argue further for the credibility of his message. This didn't just happen. And according to verse 24, it was the change that caused these Christians in Judea who had not seen Paul, but only heard of him to glorify God. They glorified God because of the change. And Paul uses his story to demonstrate that the message he preaches, a message of salvation by the grace of God alone, through faith alone, and Jesus Christ alone, is independent from others and direct from God himself. And we need to ask ourselves the question this morning, what's our story? Is our story of faith in Christ just a, a experience of some kind? Or is it a story of a changed life? Has God changed your life? I know a family back home that came to know the Lord and they did a 180 degree turn. Tommy Campbell, he was a railway worker, big drinker. God saved him. His life did a 180 degree turn. Did your life do a turn? Can somebody see by your life that you know Jesus? What are you doing in your life that's different to those around you? How would they know? Do they know? Do you do the same things as them? There's no difference. Rethink your Christianity. You know, lots of people in this in the Christian community who live around even in this area here um you know they probably would say that they're believers or christians but they haven't been to church in years and probably there's lots of people that warm the seats in churches and all they've had is some experience they said a prayer they walked the aisle they felt something during an evangelistic crusade maybe they went through some type of baptism as an adult or as a baby. Maybe they were confirmed. It is faith that saves us by God's grace, but faith demonstrates itself in changed living. And if there isn't a story of change to tell, if Jesus makes little or no difference in our daily living, then we have reason to doubt the validity of our experience. Jesus doesn't say it's by their experiences that you'll know who the true believers are. That's not what he said. It, he says in Matthew 7, by their fruit, you will know them. That's what the Lord Jesus said. By their fruit. That's what he said. You'll know who's following me by their fruit, by the things that they do. So in your home, that's where it starts. Are you the angry, grumpy old man? Thumping the table and tell everybody what they got to do? 
going off at, at the handle. Got to be a change at home. Do your kids know that you're a Christian? Okay, you come here in church. Do you read the Bible at home? Do you read it as a family? Who knows that you're a believer? And why would they know if there's no change? There needs to be things that are happening in your life and my life that indicate to my family that I want to follow Jesus and also uh, my neighbors and those whom I work, work, uh, work with. By their fruit, you'll know them. And so when a person turns to the Lord Jesus, God calls them. He keeps them. But I need to have some fruit in my life. And that's what James says. I'll show you my faith by the things that I, that I do. So what's your story? Change was evident in Paul's life. Change so evident that it pointed others to Jesus. May there be evidence in your life that you're a follower of Jesus and be challenged to, um, to talk to people, to connect people with the Lord Jesus. So they also have opportunity to trust him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day and thank you for the opportunity to follow you and serve you and thank you that you've called us and we acknowledge that it is by your grace that you have enabled us to trust you. It's not because we're special or good or whatever. It's by your grace and we thank you, Father, that you called us and that you drew us along and brought us to that point. We thank you for that. Help us to be able to connect others with you. Also, in the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you.